Jen and Cam are two funny ladies who like to talk about murder, mass murder, murder suicide, serial killers, spree killers, thrill killers, contract killings, honor killings, and a whole lot of other shit. Too heinous for me to list here. If you're disturbed by this sort of content, you may want to listen to something else. And if you're a child trying to listen to our true crime podcast, well, you better ask your mama. <laughs> Hey, Jen. Hey, Cam. How you doing? I'm doing pretty darn well. How are you? I'm doing fantastic because today we have an extra special bonus for our listeners. It's about a case we covered in December of 2018 in the very first episode of our 12 Nightmares Before Christmas. This case is one of the most infamous cases in St. Louis. It is unsolved, or actually I should say infamous case in Missouri, right there with the Springfield Three. But it's an unsolved murder, and not only is it unsolved, but it's of a child that we don't even know who she is. Her identity is unknown to this day. It all started on February 1983, when these two men enter the basement of a derelict building in the block of 5600 Clemens Avenue. Now, they stumble in there and come across a grisly, a grisly scene that would haunt the authorities as well as the community for years. Now, the 40th year anniversary is coming up on us quickly, and a local St. Louis man is fighting to get St. Louis's Jane Doe, or as she's known as Precious Hope, not only to give her her name back, but also to get the justice that she deserves. Listen now on this very special Our True Crime podcast episode as we speak to Ethra Bird Sosa, director of the documentary Our Precious Hope Revisited, St. Louis's Jane Doe which is premiering on Amazon Prime September 15th. Hey, Jen. Hey, Cam. How you doing? I am pretty stoked. We have a very special episode today with a very special guest. We do. It's a very fine man. (laughs) You want to tell everybody where we met him? Well, well, I... Let me say, so his name is Ethra Sosa, but he goes by Bird. We were, we just talked about this on our last episode that we went to um, the Dark History and Horror Convention and we met this gentleman there and he has a St. Louis connection and he is going to tell us all about it. Now we previously covered this case. You did um, Mm -hmm. our very first year i think within the first six months um you did a short little episode on it in our 12 nightmares before christmas Mm -hmm. so without further delay let's say hi to bird hey bird how are you i'm good how are you ladies (laughs) we are great thank you so much for coming on and speaking with us today do you want to tell everybody why you're talking with us right now (laughs) well i'm talking to you because of uh the case of the, the st louis little jane doe which was an African-American child that was found in St. Louis in 1983, uh, decapitated in a a vacant apartment building. Right. uh, Precious Hope, little Jane Doe, right? Yes, ma'am. Now, you did a documentary on her. That's why we're here, right? Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Or did you say that already? I didn't. No. (laughs) It's okay. It's okay. We're kind of new to this three people thing, even though that one review said we had three people. That's a long story. Uh, So if you go look up uh, unsolved, most popular unsolved cases in a state, almost every single time this case comes up for the state of Missouri. And um, I guess what we want to start with is how did you get so involved in it? And then and it culminate into this documentary that is about to premiere on the huge prime Amazon Prime. Or Prime Amazon, whichever way you want to go. Absolutely. Well, so it all goes back to me being a kid. I would have been around the same age as she possibly was in between nine and 10 years old. And I can remember during that time, you had the Atlanta child murders happening. You had Adam Walsh come up missing. And then you had this happen. So my mom had a weird sense of humor. And I can remember her telling us, hey, you got to be in the house before it gets dark because they're cutting little kids' heads off. And I can remember that. She probably said it 
one time, but I, I remembered it throughout my life. And we would talk about this case periodically here and there. Well, she passed in 2016. And uh, I said, you know what? It's something we always talked about. I should do a documentary about it. But, you know, you mention stuff and you're just like in one ear and out of the other. I'm not in the industry. I've never done a documentary. It was just a thought. Then in 2021, at the end of February, I caught COVID. And uh, I was in the hospital for six weeks. And, you know, during that time, nobody's coming in the hospital or anything. I was really bad. It was touch and go for a minute. And I told myself that if I made it through this, I'm going to make the documentary happen. Because if I died now, I would have done nothing about it. So I got out of the hospital. I sold my car. I went and bought all equipment. I did all the research online. There were certain cameras you had to buy for it to even be considered to get on some of the streaming networks. So I, so I was like, let's just start. And the interviews started falling together. They really did. It almost felt like an outside hand was helping us in this process. That's what That was what I was just going to say. What I noticed right away is how much involvement you got. And they seemed to really help you. They They wanted to help you get this solved, get this, at least this little girl a name. I liked the one uh, detective. I forgot. I which one he was but when you said that there was a rumor saying that the st louis police doesn't want anybody to help them solve this case and he's like well we'll take any help as long as it's free which kind of made me chuckle because it's sounds about right right detective sergeant brian mcglynn he's actually the detective uh one of the detectives in charge of the case now oh okay so he's not a retired the other one like the one that's right behind you He's retired from the case. The- yeah, okay. that's Burgoon. He was on scene that day. He's retired, but uh, the government actually pays him to still work on uh, unsolved cold cases. So he works for St. Louis County. Awesome. That's pretty cool. What kind of research did you like files? Because I know the you interviewed uh, Brian uh, Alapsa. Is that, was, is that how you pronounce his right? Re- Alapsa, the the guy who wrote the book on Precious Hope? Alaspa. Alaspa, sorry. You interviewed him, and you were kind of shocking him with facts that you found that he didn't know about. So what, I thought it was awesome. That's him right there. Yeah, he's right behind me on the screen. (laughs) Speaking of the devil, right? I know. So so, uh, in the initial research, I reached out to Chad Garrison. So Brian Brian Alaspa actually wrote a book based upon an article that he read by Chad Garrison in the Riverfront Times. Chad Garrison told me, you know, I really don't remember much about it because he's written so many articles. He said, I could review it, but you might want to reach out to Brian Alaspa who wrote the book uh, because he's probably more familiar with it. So I reached out to him and he actually first was a, a, a a fiction writer. So he wrote a version of this story fiction, but then he felt like the little girl really deserved her story to be told. So he went ahead and and wrote the story that he wrote secondly. So we got a hold of him and he lives in uh, Chicago now up in Naperville. So we went up there to interview him and part of it was, I mean, he, he knew the case up until that point. But I, I wanted to show that I went a little deeper and and that the information we got, other people just didn't know. Now, we've always been told, or I, ever since I knew about the case, because we're about the same age as she was um, when it happened. But we always heard it was two men finding trying to find car parts to fix their car. How did you actually find out who they were? It, tell us from the, from the beginning the, the true story because we haven't even discussed exactly what the crime was okay uh, well like you said the story that's always been out there was that uh, two men driving through this desolate part of St. Louis vehicle breaks down they need to fix their drive train so they're going in to find a pipe either to hit it or to hold the hood open so and uh that's how they discovered the body so as you all saw in the film 
totally untrue. The two men turned out to be 17 and 18 years old. Uh, they were just going. Exactly. So I, I can't either. And they lived across the street. That's what was crazy. They, they didn't even own a car. So how the story got to the public and what was told to me by some of the cops that were on it was that they thought this case would be solved almost instantly, like in a week or two. So they, they really didn't put a cap on what people told uh, the press. So a couple of people told the press a couple of different stories. So six months down the road, when they haven't solved this, now they got to mold a story out of the stories. So that's kind of how it came about. Like you, you, you all saw in my film, when I, I asked each cop individually, and I did that on purpose. Some people said, asked me, why did I show each person's story? It's because that's the story that's always been told. And they try to hold true to that story. But when you bring the facts out to them, they don't deny those either because he's instantly like, yep, you're right. You know, that, that is the real story. And how, and how that came about uh, is in the research, I, I get an email from a guy that's like, hey, I saw what you're doing. I think it was my uncle. And I don't know what it was about this particular email, but I followed up with him. I said, you know what? I'll ask the, the cop. So I was interviewing one of the cops that didn't want to be on film and we're talking. So I threw the names out there just to see if he'd bite on them. And he was like, yeah, 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 that's them. So I knew I had them. Uh, so that's kind of earlier when you, you all asked, how did uh, the police get involved? When you come to them and be the first thing they, they do for the first 30 minutes, is kind of vet you to see, you know, why are you doing this or whatever? But when you pull out the names of people that haven't been released, when you can show them crime scene photos that, that they don't even have anymore. And when I pull the sweater out, you know, kind of the floodgates open and they just start really helping me out. They really did. You can almost see where the story came from because the kids were minors and they probably didn't want the names getting out. So they just made up the story. It was two men. And I'm sure the kids were just going into this abandoned building to check it out and see what was going on, right? I mean, that because that totally makes sense. In talking to the family, because this is the, the gentleman who's passed away. So the two guys' names are Harris and Thompson. That's their last names. That's what I've chosen to release because they have street names and they have regular names. So depending on who you're talking to, it can get confusing, but they are the same people. Uh, so Thompson has passed away, but I did speak to his family and they told me that when the boys found the body, they didn't even realize that the head was cut off at this point. They just knew they saw a body. They ran back, got everybody, and they all went into the basement collectively, which is right behind me, by the way. <laughs> but uh, they all go in, <laughs> they all go into the basement and as they're dusting the leaves off, uh, is when they noticed that the, the head was off. What's crazy about that is I remember in the first interview with Bergun, I asked him, was the body covered? And he told me no. But if you look at the crime scene pictures, there's leaves right around where the body was. So it makes perfect sense, the story. And when talking to her, she described crime scene photos to me that she had never even seen, like, perfectly. Can you describe a little bit about the victim? I know, I think we've only talked about her age. Well, she's between eight to 11, No, right? I said that's what we did do, but the, right. the information. Absolutely. So uh, how do I want to state this? Because she probably is close to the nine, nine-year-old range. Uh, it's always been speculated that she was older but that was based up on a measurement that is probably wrong. Uh, so the press in releasing the measurement, they released that up until the several point, she was four foot 10, but nowhere in the autopsy does it say that. It says 58 inches, but it also doesn't say the measurement of the feet. So in the film, uh, forensic pathologist, Dr. Joy Carter introduces, if it doesn't say that, then they probably measured from the toe because of her being for five days, her foot was probably flat. So they probably measured from the toe to the neck. So you would have to reduce 
the size of the foot, which would bring her height down even with a head to about four foot eleven, four foot ten. Right, because she said you had to measure from the heel for the correct height, but they were measuring from the toe up. Right. And so she a- she was a- absolutely so a nine year old African American girl prepubescent, right? Because that's our victim. And she was found only the police, I, I do want to say this. So the police wanted us to focus on the rape because the, the severity of the rape has never been out there. And Dr. Joy Carter genuinely believes that this is either the first or only kill for a rapist, that this criminal is probably a rapist by trade. And and because of how close that person was to this person is how the murder became involved. That 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 was the belief. Now, the prepubescent that you mentioned, uh, and I'm sorry I cut you off there, but I wanted to point out that that was the newspaper's way of trying to describe bad information they were getting. She's not, she is prepubescent, but her genitalia is not even defined or formed yet. So she has child genitalia. So prepubescent can be, you know, getting ready to have your period in a year or two, but She's younger than that. Can you tell us a little bit about how the condition of her when they found her? I'm kind of 50-50 on that too. Uh, and, and here's what I mean by that. I The story's always been we, we flipped her over and we realized she was a child. Don't think so. I, I, I think that opinion was formed the next morning at, uh, at the morgue because, I mean, p- people do body scaping. So I just don't think if you're missing this or that, you're going to automatically say, Hey, this is a child, you, you know? So I don't, mm-hmm. I don't believe that on, on the scene, but she was laying face down just inside of the doorway, almost as if somebody just dropped her out, out of their arms. Uh, and I know I've heard other podcasts and stories that she was hidden in a corner or something like that, but this is an eight room basement where the furthest point is still another two rooms away. So she's only 36 feet from the alley into the second room, just inside of the door. Uh, She's laying face down, her arms are behind her. And even though they're tied, they're not necessarily bound. And I think you ladies kind of heard that multiple times in the film. It's more of a, a control thing, both when she's alive to cut her respiration off, but also it just kept her arms bound together as they were carrying the body. And she didn't have anything around her ankles or anything. It was just her hands that were tied. No. And she only had yes. the yellow sweater yep. on. Just is that, that correct? Nude from the yeah. waist down? Absolutely. Which, which that day they were calling a yellow jumper. Uh, that's what they were. And she was referred to 24 hours later as Sweater Girl. So she hadn't even become St. Louis Jane Doe yet. What about, tell us about the sweater. You uh, proved your sleuth and skills, your little uh, Nancy Drew inside of you. Tell us about that sweater. Absolutely. So after being into the case probably about a year, uh, I, I wanted to see kind of what the sweater looked like. Uh, but of course, it's not around anymore. So I told myself, I know it's been missing 39 years, but let's just see if I can find something that looked like it. And inside of a few weeks, I found what I believed was it. So I worked with a couple of manufacturers, two in Michigan and one in Wisconsin. And they let me correspond with uh, their thread experts. And so they were comparing threads for me. And all three came back that the way the stitching was on the sweater, that this had to be the manufacturer of the sweater. Now, it, they may have made it for multiple companies and put different labels in, but this would have been who the original manufacturer, manufacturer was, which was Paragon. And uh, so when we contacted them, the only sweater with the four marks on the neck, which is what, as the collar was cut out, was the Robert Bruce sweater. And it was available at a twelve to fourteen dollar price point in the St. Louis and across the U.S. But you know, in stores like J.C. Penney, Sears, mm-hmm. and Dillard's stores like that. So uh, that's amazing. I actually got 
the sweater. I appreciate that. The the police thought so too. You saw it in the film, saw, and um, they were shocked to say that. <laughs> I know. I saw him trying to take a picture yeah. of it with his cell phone. It was it was amazing. Good job on that. And also, you were able to track down the rope that was used. Correct. Yeah, and it yes, ma'am. And then talking about the rope, uh, so I didn't introduce it into the film, but so it the rope is was well, actually not nylon, as it's been reported for forty years. It's po- polyurethane, and it's a ski braided rope. It's probably in between six to ten feet, so it was to estimate eight feet, and they're using it just as a wraparound. Now, the uniqueness about the particular rope, which is in the police reports, is that it's supposed to be spun at 153 threads, and this particular rope only had 152. Now, they've always hid that from the public because they believe if they could figure out who was spinning it one thread short, they'd know who the manufacturer was, but they they haven't to this point, and the police shared that with me. And and the police are more open now than ever, you know, with the 40th anniversary coming up, they, they really just want this solved. So I think you, we all do, to be honest. Y- yes. You mentioned a little, and I don't want to give too much away. And if, if we ask something and you'd want to save that for the movie, just say that and we'll cut it, cut it out for you. But you mentioned something about, you guys are from St. Louis. You can, you can hear anything. <laughs> That's true. Um, you mentioned you had one little word in there when you talked about that sweater, and I think it was lost or found. Do you want to tell us what happened to that sweater? And also that sweater had lots and lots of blood on it, which, you know, might be important today. Absolutely. What? Why don't we do this? Because it is your podcast. Why don't you all tell the story that you've always heard for 40, well, 30 years, and then I'll, I'll tell the story of why that's not true. Well, it was reported, or what I reported was uh, there was a psychic that was interested in the case, and it was from a TV show, I believe, and she needed that sweater and the rope to actually feel it, to get the sense of actually what was, to solve the case, she had to touch the actual objects that were with little Jane Doe, Um, so they mailed it to her. Well, she said she mailed it back, but it never got back. It was lost in the mail, or they thought possibly she just never sent it. Even though she swore she sent it, it just never showed back up. That's how I always heard it. And what did Bird do? He found out something brand new that nobody knows. (laughs) Absolutely. So I felt that that was key. I wanted to know everything that happened. So I talked to a lot of the people involved and they all told me, well, we need to go down and search her closet. So I call her up, which the show was citing. And believe it or not, that show, show was that show itself was actually produced by Fonzie, Henry Winkler. So oh, yeah, really? I, didn't I thought know that, that was funny. I love the Fonz. <laughs> Absolutely. So I call, I call her uh, and her name's uh, Noreen Rainier. Very nice lady. I sent her email first. She sent me back her phone number almost immediately. She's like, I always want to help kids. What is what is it we have to do? So she writes in books all of her cases. So she told me, well, let me find the book. And she couldn't find the book. And then I told her, well, this was for a show of sightings. And she said that the show's producers handled everything and even kept her books. So I would have to get a hold of them. So but she assured me that it got sent back in the mail. She said, I gave it to the producer. They went and they mailed it right then. It, it got sent back. So I'm under the impression, okay, she sent it back. Let's let's figure out what happened to it. And um, my, my assistant researcher, who's a lady named Mary Weather, she finds an article dated in 1991 that Noreen gave that said, people just send me stuff I don't ask for and I throw it in my closet. So my head's like, okay, it's in our closet. Like the police are saying, it has to be. So I call her back and she's like, no, I, I don't want to be interviewed because I, I don't feel at this point there's nothing I can add to the case. But I'm telling you, I sent it back. So my next interview was with Detective Sergeant Brian McGlynn and I bring up Noreen and as you, you all hear in the film, he's like, it's funny you bring her up. And I'm like, yeah, I talked to her. He said, I have too. I have the receipt where she sent it back to the police station. Then he kind of dials it back a little bit. And he's like, well, she sent something back. But then he kind of went, you know, he he admitted 
like, okay, we signed for it. It's lost by the police department in the police station. And I don't think they've ever put that out there, but I don't think they corrected it either. No, Uh, no. So, and it sounds like the man that took all the, the package in who signed for it still works on the police force because he wasn't going to divulge that man's name either, which I don't blame him. I mean, that's pretty big screw up. Yeah, absolutely. About that is when, when he's telling me that in my mind, I'm literally thinking like, you know, you're not supposed to tell me this, right? (laughs) So so when it was over, I'm like, Hey, can I use that in the film? And he's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's time. So I was just going to say that I think at this point, they're kind of like 40 years, you know, it's time. We, we got to figure this out for her to give her a name and hopefully figure out who did it to that poor baby. Who was Um, the most helpful? I would say, man, I, I think they all were helpful in, in, I think it was helpful to do them in the order I did because I knew what to ask the next person. Had I did it in reverse order, I don't think I would have got the same answers because I wouldn't have had the questions. So, but, but I think Dr. Joy Carter was very helpful. She introduced some new stuff to the case that the police, yeah, the police hadn't even heard that before. Like the whole part of, uh, well, let me answer this question before we get into that. But I thought Eric was very helpful describing the scene I as love a person Eric. that lived in that community. I wrote that at the end. Love neighbor Eric. That's in my yeah, notes absolutely. because like he, he did a great job. But he also <laughs> like he took you there at that time and then took you back in time. Uh-huh. I thought he did a great job. Yay, Eric. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I liked him too. We can talk about Joy uh, because here's the funny thing. Well, I, I had had the autopsy, which I know you ladies have seen, but I had that autopsy probably about nine months and I read it at least once a week, but I honestly don't know what I'm reading. So I'm like, I'm, it's a Saturday. I'm, I'm literally watching YouTube and I'm like, I need to find a forensic pathologist that could talk to me and tell me in in normal terms what this means and i literally start looking for a forensic pathologist on youtube and she popped up and she spoke in words i could understand so i reached out to her and she told me yeah i'll do it not a problem i I, she was having knee surgery though so i had to wait during the course of that so i'm waiting on the the interview with her and i I think it's going to be just a quick interview stuff like that she had like you guys saw the autopsy is four pages. She came with mm-hmm. a stack this thick of her notes. Our interview is almost three hours long. It really could have been an hour and 20 minutes of just her because there's other stuff mm-hmm. she said that I just had to narrow it down to keep it with, within a two hour time frame. But yeah, she, she's got some great information. But going back to your original question, I think Abby and cc moore added a lot as well Mm -hmm. i agree i really agree and i and another things before we get into abby and cc moore um i was amazed that the botanical garden helped out correct right yeah it's well it's all it's always been reported that way but i all i'll say about that is I think maybe they worked for the botanical garden, but they worked at St. Louis university. Mm, let me, okay. let me explain why there. So okay. if you guys look at the, the mold report that I gave you all, it, it says St. Louis university. When I was interviewing Dr. Mary case, she told me that she, she worked at the St. Louis morgue, but she worked for St. Louis university. So the university doctors, were actually lent out to other agencies. So even though they're reporting for those agencies, they worked for St. Louis University. And for those that don't know, um, when little Jane Doe's body was found, she had some mold growing on where her head would have been and where there was another spot. Was it on her leg? Her, her, her chest and her, her legs, chest. yes. Right. Three areas. Right. And they were able to determine by the mold growth how long she had been in that basement before she was found. So that kind of science amazes me that they can do stuff like that. So Mary Case was the one with the mold. 
She didn't do the autopsy? Mary Kate. No, Mary Kate did the autopsy. And okay. she submitted the mold. Uh, and I the think. results were sent back to her. It, I, I don't know if you guys have them in front of you, but who actually did the the mold is right there on the report. The people that actually okay. did the case. Yeah, actually, I forgot to bring mine downstairs with me. So um, going, <laughs> sorry. I'm going sorry. Back to Dr. <laughs> Going back to Dr. Joy, who I adore, she's like my new hero. She brought up a couple of things. We've been a little vague about exactly what this was. So I'm going to kind of um, just go over it a little bit. So we have a young female child decapitated, um, sexually assaulted, and with her Horribly hands, sexually assaulted. hands tied behind yeah. her. We're following the movie like for Missouri Botanical Gardens came up right as you guys brought that up. <laughs> That's why I giggled. And now there's Dr. Joy in the back. Yeah, yep. See, this is perfect. <laughs> Um, yeah. The movie, for those listening, um, we're on video so we can see each other, but Bird has the movie playing behind him. And every time we talk, usually it falls right in line. But the one thing that I wanted to bring up about Dr. Joy said that she thought the most important t- takeaways from this, I guess, back in 1983, the decapitation was so big. But she's like, that's not that was secondary. The first thing was the sexual assault and that um, there was a huge vaginal tear tear, and and she was strangled there was evidence around her neck that there were bruises so she was strangled so why did dr joy i mean i think i know the answer i just want to hear you say it why did dr joy think that we need to look at that not the decapitation and you know people like the decapitation because it's salacious but that's not we're missing the point here well mary Mary case and uh mary's probably not going to like this but there's a couple points in her autopsy that kind of go against each other because she uses the word clean, but she also uses striration marks. So it can't be clean if it has striration marks. So the clean probably was the flesh itself is what was cleanly cut, but the bones had striation marks. Uh, the severity of the rape, again, the police, the, when, when I told the police I was having the autopsy looked at by, by uh, Dr. Joy Carter, their words to me was, please have her focus on the rape. It, it hasn't been out there enough how bad and how severe it was. So I asked her that. And when she came with her booklet, I, I swear to you, it was a booklet. She She had never heard of this case and she didn't, she wanted to give she didn't want to do research on this case prior to doing that because she wanted her eyes to be fresh. And uh, so uh, the posterior forchette is ripped completely open from the vaginal area to the anus. So there's, uh, it, it's almost ripped apart. The, the girl's body is, is, is torn apart, uh, basically. And, uh, and this was done while she was alive. She feels was, it was proven that they believe that was while done. she was alive. Yes, Ab- absolutely. And the police were shocked by that because they've had this looked at by multiple forensic people, and some of the, the points that Dr. Carter brought up ha- hasn't been brought up to them before. But the evidence is there, and that's the a- there's blood aspirated in the lungs, and the only thing in her stomach was blood. And she had to be alive to swallow those things and to ingest them for them to be in those locations. So that that had never been brought up until my film. And, um, and so that meant told me, that, hey, we're going to need it. So Dr. Joy said that she was probably hit upon the face or the head or kicked or something to have all that blood go down her throat and into her stomach. And in her lungs, absolutely, absolutely, and it had to be in the in the center of the face for the nose because the nose is what would have sent it to the aspirated lungs. Mm-hmm. And for the binding of the hands uh, was used to cut respiration off. So as the child would struggle during the rape, they they would take the rope and pull it back so that it would restrict the breathing and the movement of the child. Awesome. So was it the rope wrapped around her neck and her? wrists almost like a hog tie without the feet no 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 n- not at all so the 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 impressions on the that were left for the strangulation were uh pressure marks as if a, like a right hand was on and they were on the left side pressed pressed down so they could tell that there's a few fingers 
on the that on the left side of the body. So that would have meant that it was a right hand because of those fingers on that side. And it was said that she had passed by the time they decapitated her, correct? Absolutely. Yes, sir. absolutely. What Dr. Carter wanted to make clear, too, is that it's people always sensationalize the decapitation where that's actually third in the order. And it should be looked at third because of that. What's the order that she says that we should go by? The rape, the beating, and then decapitation? Probably the beating first leading beating into first. the rape. And it, continu- and it continued through the rape. And then after the child, w- w- then the, it was the rape and beating, strangulation, then the decapitation. So that's the, the order of three. Unreal. Just unreal. And then, of course, uh, the whole... She, the poor thing had this life. Once she, once the autopsy was completed, they, she sat in the morgue for how long? Nine months. Nine months. Correct. Yep. Nine months. And yes, then she ma'am. was buried. And then <laughs> that whole first burial. You want to tell us about that? It's hard. It's un- unfathomable. I mean, yeah. it's just. Yeah, so there's always been a, a cu- there's always been a couple of pictures out there about that first burial. So I wanted to get in contact with somebody who was actually there to to you know paint that scene for us rather than just showing the picture. So I got a hold of Ed Sade, who uh, is the one that later on they actually use his pictures for that purpose. So it was a, and he'd never been contacted before. So he told me. Like the people who were there were four pallbearers and the people are, and I mentioned it in the film, they're mislabeled because Herb Riley wasn't even there, but yet he's quoted in the newspaper by saying he's been on the case, but he's not even there. It's actually Joe Burgoon that they're, they're misquoting. So you're, you're seeing from the beginning that the newspaper is just putting out whatever they feel like. They're not really doing their research on who these people are. So, uh, you have the in the major major photo that people see the when you see the preacher so that's reverend haywood right next to him on the side of him that that is not lieutenant atkins that is jesse haywood that's the guy who prepared the body and donated the casket and then and then you have the medical examiner and joe burgoon now if you look in the far distance probably about 20 feet away there's Lieutenant Atkins and there's a lady next to him who's a representative of the state. So other than the four pallbearers, that's who was there. Now there was multiple members of the press there, but they had their own section to be in. And of course the press doesn't report who else in the press is there. And it took like five minutes. Basically they carried the body from the Hearst, which where she's buried, uh, there's like a road that's probably 15 feet away. It's not far from where she was originally buried. So they carried her about 15 feet. And then uh, Reverend Haywood, you know, basically said a prayer and it was over within five minutes. Yeah. And the pallbearers and were it. actually the, the pallbearers were actually the men that dug her grave, correct? Is that true? Yes, they're the ones who carried the casket. Absolutely. Yes, that is true. Then we find out when we go years later. Oh, no, before that even, they weren't allowed to put um, the Schaefer Monument Company wanted to put a monument down and the ME wouldn't let them. That blows my mind. Was there a reason? This is actually going to lead into something that's not in the film, too. So I'm glad you're going down this path. So... I think it, it was key to me uh, in searching the head, headstone because it's it's widely been reported that some kids donated some money and bought a headstone, but that was really wrong. So Miss Schaefer wanted to donate the headstone. However, the the cemetery wouldn't allow them to put it on there because they didn't know the little girl's name or anything like that. So they made the headstone. I mean, Schaefer's the one who picked out, you know, the saddened hearts, you know, that whole saying. And so the headstone's just sitting there. So some kids in Livingston, Illinois, hear about the story, hear that 
the the cemetery is not letting them put the headstone down and uh the so they contact the cemetery the cemetery says no it's not us it's the medical examiner he says it's not appropriate to get a donated headstone so they write letters to the medical examiner and and he's basically like no i didn't say that go ahead and 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 put it down now i think this is key because this isn't in in the film but i will introduce something here for you off you can follow me uh so she's buried in december and the cemetery has to stop burying bodies after 1983 they can't bury any more bodies uh per the state so there's technically no more burials happening after this point why not so why was it in may it was it was being shut down by the state for for uh because the a key point there's a lot going on so right. in 83 they were shutting it down so the only way they could start rebar- reburying is in 1986 the owner gave it to virginia younger who was his secretary she's the one who later committed suicide but she was she's not the owner at this point she's just the like running it she's his personal secretary and all that so they transferred the title so that she could go ahead and start doing the burials again and stuff like this so his mismanagement is why they were shutting it down and they needed a new owner so fast forward from her being buried into december to them now having to place the headstone in may all right so virginia we know virginia younger's there because she gives an interview uh, to the post dispatch, and she says, "Well, I think it's a good thing the kids wrote this, and we were able to put it down." But here's where things get tricky. All right, so again, remember she's buried in December. I know I've said it three times, but it's key. So when Abby later, as I know, we'll talk about when they find where she's buried, there's a body buried on top of her. So that had to occur between December and May. Uh, December 83, May of uh, 1984. So that could be a reason that they didn't want to put the headstone down because they had already placed a body on top of it. And now if we put that headstone in the right spot, the family of that person is going to know we reused that grave. So I genuinely believe the headstone was put in the in the vicinity, but purposely not put on her grave. Now they were pretty much the way they ran that cemetery wasn't uh, up to code by any means, correct? Oh, a- absolutely. So there's uh, there's actually a, a paper about that cemetery that was written by a WashU graduate student. It's actually a good read that goes into the history. And uh, uh, yeah, so they would actually... Let me pause there. Uh, so in my research, I found several people that told me that they would dig by, dig the holes to put the casket in. But apparently they would tell other people in the St. Louis crime area and bodies would get dropped underneath the caskets. So that's why when you when you dig in a grave, you'll find three bodies in one grave. Bodies are only buried a foot down, two feet down. Yeah. Now, what? is that the cemetery that did this, or was this like, uh, like the, the... this would be the uh, the crime syndicates in the area? Okay. Okay. So, okay. so imagine. I guess to make the story under more understandable is so the pallbearers, well, not the pallbearers, the the grave diggers would dig the grave mm. for the, a funeral the next day. And when they would come the next day to put the casket in, the rumor is bodies would already have been dropped in overnight. So when they buried the casket on top, people that's missing in the area are already in those graves. Oh, But the bodies that would be in the, the ground that were dropped there, they would be covered? Or did the Paul, uh, the the grave Co- diggers covered with just a j- covered with just a little bit of dirt okay so like the people that dug the graves or put the casket in, they wouldn't know that there was a they were doing what they were doing right <laughs> okay i got you yeah. that's a, 
<laughs> I'm just I'm just telling you what, what what my what my research uncovered. Okay. So and, and, and again, that's that's the stories. Yep. Okay. Like Bob and there are, Joe. Like, yeah, some of the some of the stories you gotta take with a grain of salt because we we also were told in the beginning uh that uh the reason her body wasn't found is because they had to keep moving it because people were trying to dig it up. And as soon as that story started, I just walked away. And the two members on my staff stayed there listening to the story and they come walking over and, and they're like, hey, I can't believe they were moving her body like that. And I said, it can't be true because if it were true, they wouldn't have been able to triangulate her body later based upon pictures. So we know that story is not right. true. You know, so so there are a lot of right. rumors about that cemetery. Well, now that you mentioned triangulate and that big word that's math related that, you know, that's fun. Um, why don't you tell us about Amy and how you were able to find her little um, Jane Doe's body? Because for a while they tried to exhume her for an isotope test, but they couldn't find her body. Absolutely. Uh, and it, it's Abby. Uh, so Abby, I'm sorry. Uh, so her uncle was familiar with the case and he was reading a, st a story and he knew that she went to wash you and she was learning uh what's called 2d calibration uh which is like a lo locating stuff based upon old pictures locating stuff now so he told her you should get involved in the case and uh so she reached out to people and uh she wanted she felt she could do it but as she to told us in the film you know she they're looking at first they're looking like at billboards thinking that they can pinpoint it. But when they came through and they built the Metro link, they actually tore those billboards down. And when they, they had to move them 10 feet over, but nobody told them that. So they were looking at pictures and the, and the billboards 10 feet from where it was. So it's throwing them off. But over the course of a, a, a few years, they were able to basically almost pinpoint the body within eight inches. Of, of where it actually was. And at first... Now, that's they, a hero to me. Oh, definitely. For first, it was it had to be devastating because she pinpointed it where she thought it was and they dug three feet down and they got it, they hit a casket and it wasn't her because of what you said earlier. They went down further and they found her body. Which, just seriously, Absolutely. this poor little girl... Through through life and death, she's been through the ringer. It's been horrible. Oh. But that's amazing. Absolutely. That's amazing that she was able to do oh, what is. she did. Abby. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And Abby, Abby was great. Abby was somebody I wanted to interview from the beginning, but I couldn't get a hold of. And, and when I was getting ready to cut the final cut of this film, Abby, after a year and a half, actually hit me back on the email and said, I'll, I'll do it for you next Friday. So she oh, like awesome. fell right in line and, and her whole interview, like literally we were on, on the zoom call, maybe 12 minutes. And she gave a great story. Like she was, she was nonstop. Like it was awesome. And her energy is like infectious. You know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you can tell through the screen. Didn't you think so, Cam? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think everything, it's almost like when you know that you're supposed to do something, everything fell in line for you. Like it, like you said, like you interviewed them in order and it just made it easier for you. I don't know, but I think it's time this little girl gets some answers, you know? Yeah, let me answer that. Let me let me let me state that real quick, because that's, that's perfect when I said a guided hand, what you said. I mean, this is this is the honest truth. Uh. So when I started, I'm like, okay, well, let me start with Chad Garrison. Chad's the one who led me to Brian. So Brian's like, yeah, I'll do it. So then I'm talking to my cousin, who's a St. Louis cop, and I'm like, I really wish I could find Officer Bagoon, the original officer. I know he's alive. He's done. He's never done a documentary, but he's done TV reports. My cousin said, well, I know a Bagoon. Let me make a phone call. So he calls me back and he says, well, it's not him, but it's his dad. So I gave him his number and his dad's supposed to call you. So that just fell in line. So we go visit the grave of St. Louis Jane Doe and we can't find it. So there's a guy out there cutting the grass. So I asked my, my teammate, uh, Romeo Austin, hey, go ask him if he knows where it's at. So Romeo comes back and he said, 
He's going to take us over there. But not only that, he was one of the volunteers that dug it up. And he said he'll go ahead and give us an interview. So that just fell in line. And Abby fell in line. And Ed Sade fell in line. And nobody ever, even though they used his pictures to triangulate where the body was with the 2D calibration, they only reached out to him for the pictures. They didn't invite him to the to the grave searching or anything like that. So he knew nothing of what was going on other than people needed his pictures. That that was it. And he, he followed the case a little bit. His 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 wife has too, you know, so I it it just everything just fell in place. Eric, so the guy you see behind me, Eric. That's Eric. I love Eric. Me and Eric have known <laughs> me and Eric have known each other probably 30 plus years and in that time we never went even though it affected us both in different ways we never talked about it together because we only knew each other like playing basketball or community centers and stuff like that and when I was starting the documentary Eric said are you talking about the little girl that was found on the west side and I'm like yeah that's the one I'm doing he's like dude I was there and you know you get you get the picture of these people like Freddie Jefferson and that and they're in the pictures so you know they're telling you the truth one of the things that he said that kind of shocked me too is um the hard work that the police department did so they just start calling local St. Louis schools around there well then there was busing so then you had to go outside and then there was the secretary there was like a shortage with funds so nobody kept track on if a kid was there or not which just blew my mind because that would never that would never fly today because you if you you have to call home second hour if the kid's not there because you want to make sure that you know something's not amiss. But also when he goes over that and he just keeps talking about the schools and he's pinned, well this one's connected to this one and like after that like I needed a breath because he was like well you got this school but this school really has three branches and then you have this and and to know that those police <laughs> had to call all these schools to find out if they were missing a little girl is shocking. Yeah. Didn't they contact like every school in St. Louis to find out if they were missing a child, right? Or something? Yeah, they went in order. They they contacted uh, every school and the, the list that they had was missing eight to 11 year old girls. They were doing that, that frame since the mid seventies to that point. But a lot of them had already returned and the mothers never even called the police to say, hey, she's back or anything like that. But the here's here's a sign of the times for the 80s. So because of budget costs, the Board of Education decided, hey, we got computers now. We don't need school secretaries. They didn't know you needed somebody to put to input information into the computers. <laughs> it's magic. It just goes in there. Yeah, it was it was crazy. Unreal. Yep, absolutely. And and you know, there's a lot of speculation with YouTubers and 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 articles that's out there saying that, you know, they were they were misreporting to get money for the school system. And though that may have happened on a couple of kids, I mean, we're not talking about somebody gaming the system. We're talking about a system that was pretty much bad to begin with. You know, they weren't really trying to take the money. If you don't even know the kid transferred, how do you, how do you know he's not in your school anymore? Which the schools are behind us right now, by the way. (laughs) I'm telling you, this is falling right in line because I do. Eric was still up there talking and I was like, that's the part I talked about where he just kept going to this school, this school, blah, blah, blah. And then Kirkwood and then Rockwood and, you know, so I wasn't, it's amazing. He could keep all of those straight. I mean, I don't know all the branches of the school systems. So he went into it pretty in depth. Um, I, I, if I'm a little check your phone, Jen, if I'm a little, my daughter's car just broke down and she's stuck on the side of the road. So I'm sitting here trying oh, to make God. sure somebody can get her as we're doing this. So that's why okay. a little bit. Uh, yeah. Um, back to the story. Okay. So when they, after they, uh, took her up and then they had to rebury her and that was done in was it 2016 is that right 2014 14 the one thing and not that i have a cold heart because i don't but i think jen and i've been doing this enough but what really got me and i full-on cried 
when I watched it yesterday was when that um, second funeral director put angels, had angels on the corners of her, I'm going to cry now, angels on the corner of her coffin so she'd never be alone again because she's been alone for so long. I was like, oh, I'm tearing up now. It, it just, I, I really like that it seems like there was a change in the community that they came together with that. I mean, she finally got a decent service, the one she should have had long ago. Yeah, absolutely. And those people, exactly. Those people, I don't think get enough credit. Everybody is out there. Like I, I read with the YouTuber and stuff. Oh, we in St. Louis gave her her name and all of this. They, no. they didn't. So uh, it was given to her at Calvary for her second burial. That's where she got the name Precious Hope. And uh, the which we talk talking about stuff falling in line. So when I was first cutting the film, I was I knew that there were bagpipes there. I'm like, I gotta get Amazing Grace. And then when we got a hold of the deacon who did it, he gave me the actual obituary, and they really played Amazing Grace. So I thought that was crazy. And then it, in working with them, they led me to where I could get the actual funeral footage from from her burial. You, you know, so that's there. Uh, we actually had the deacon read his 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 gospel reading that he read at site. So we tried to put that as close to what occurred that day as we possibly could. It was yeah meaningful. But this one was an hour long too. Yeah, I um, and that was right after they exhumed the body to get uh, some more, I guess, to take a sample of her bones to get the isotope for isotope testing. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, that was why they wanted her was for the isotope testing. So when they got her up, they uh, took portions of her bones and sent them to the Smithsonian and to the university of North Texas. So something good that came out of this film is the night I, I had premiered this for the police, the, the cop, McGlynn comes up to me and he said, you know, I called the Smithsonian to see if there was anything else they had to add to the case so I could tell you. And they told me that we still have a six inch section of her bone. So they're mailing it back to the St. Louis police now. So they won't have to re-exhume her in the future That's need right. be because they still have a section of her bone that they didn't even know they still had. Uh, with the isotope testing, it came back and I, and this is my opinion, but I'm just going to point it out this way. So uh, National Missing and Exploiting Children was who was working with the Smithsonian. And they came back with a list of states that are all northern mm -hmm. and parallel to the Smithsonian, where the University of North Texas came back with all southern states, which are parallel to the University of North Texas. So my question in doing it is, what are they cleaning their equipment with? Because if it's water-based from their area, that's why it's linear. Because each of their researches are linear. So that there has to be something that's being missed in their cleaning process, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Right. And I'm, I'm not a scientist, but it, it, it's too it's too far apart for it to be anything Well, I else. thought it was amazing. There's like a clear line because you have I, – Smithsonian – I wrote this down. Smithsonian had Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio – um, Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, and Indiana. And then Texas had Louisiana, Tennessee, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, um, Georgia, Florida, and North and South Carolina. Like there is a fine line in between in like Missouri and Illinois and um, Kentucky are all absent, but everybody, it's like they took a belt on the area, right? It, that's what I thought was odd that it's just one clean area. I, I totally agree with that. And with, with that being said, whenever you see interviews and stuff like that, the police always lean towards the Southern states and never mention what the Smithsonian's talking about. Now we, we should look at it this way. The Smithsonian is probably world renowned for their research, but yet the police were looking at the Southern states and blowing off the Smithsonian, that's because they had been working the DNA for eight years without people even knowing, and it was pushing them towards the Southern states. They weren't blowing off 
the the Smithsonian. They just knew because of genetic genealogy which way they needed to be looking. So this is a perfect segue into CC Moore and how you reached out to her and how she has really made, just like you, made some huge strides in this case that is well overdue. Absolutely. So CC Moore, let's let, let's get into that. So in talking to Detective Brian McGlynn, uh, I, I I'll say this. So a year prior. Uh, some people in the police department, this is what they told me. They said, I, uh, they, they, I, I went to them and I'm like, I would like to do a documentary that maybe we could raise money and do some DNA testing. And they stopped me. They said, it's already being done. And I said, well, I know Paragon, I mean, uh, I know that, um, Parabon does reconstruction of the faces and they stopped me again. They said, that's already being done. He said, we, we, we know some family members. Now, again, this is a year and a half ago that I was told this. We know that there's family members in the St. Louis area, but they may not know their family members. You cannot release that unless your research leads you that direction. And it didn't at, at first. So I kept my word and all of that. But then I'm talking to Brian McGlynn and he's telling me, yeah, we got some relatives. You know, we excluded a lot of people. We, we know a direction. And, uh, so he's like, you might want to reach out to Parabon. I'm like, so you think they'll talk to me? He's like, you know, we at the police department gave him permission to, and we'll even reconfirm that to him if we need to. So I reach out to them. I don't hear from them for like a week. And then I hear from like four people and they're all like, you'll get on with CC Moore. You'll get on with CC Moore. And all I knew about CC Moore is she had a TV show on ABC called the genetic detective that I had seen a few episodes of. So, uh, I'm waiting to talk to her, and it, it was a Zoom call. Of course, she's in California. The minute the Zoom call started, like she literally was like, uh, "So I'm I'm excited for you, and I'm confused." And I'm like, "Yeah, I know you have a show, and I know when you solve this case, you're gonna want to save stuff for your show. Please don't tell me anything like that." She's like, "I've been waiting to talk about this case for almost seven years. I haven't been able to talk about it to anybody." She's like. Let's go. Oh, Let's start awesome. now. I'm, I'm ready. And, and she just, yeah, she was like, turn it on and let's get going. And I cut it out because the film's not about me, but, but she was like, mm. kudos to you for getting to this That's point true. and, and having everyone. So, and it wasn't, I mean, I definitely, definitely want to talk more about CC more, but I do want to say too, that the national missing and exploited children actually talk to me as well and they basically told me hey you're building a really good relationship with the police don't ruin it you know let them approve what you're putting out mm -hmm. so there has been a screening of this film with the police and everything in it they're yeah. okay with oh, so good. there's nothing that's bad mouthing anybody or whatever so they know what's in it and they're okay with it but cc was amazing uh so basically which I didn't know is, you know, we always hear on TV, oh, do Ancestry and me and, and all of that, and we'll figure it out. But they can't, you know, some of their bylaws don't let uh, the police research actually go in unless people opt into it. And if you don't opt into it, they can't do the research on it because of what some rogue police mm -hmm. have done in the past. And she pointed out a few instances of that. But because of her research, she was able to to get it fairly close so they know that the lineage of St. Louis Jane Doe comes from Alabama through Memphis on one side of the family and then there's a particular county that I can't mention in Texas but it does come out of Texas they're just having because of slavery trouble on finding the link be between those two families and it's not even about the names because, you know, names, surnames change over time. So they know what the original surnames were, but that may not be the name mm -hmm. of Jane Doe. Right. I found it interesting that the first two hits they had were people that were 99 years old and 100 years old. And like she said, she, she can't go back anything since back further than the 1870s because of the records that were kept on the African-American slaves 
or African slaves, I guess, um, they just, there were no records until 1870 because of that's when they started to become listed on the federal uh, census, right? But what I was floored. Yeah, that's when they were listed them by name. Right. I was floored. I was shocked about when that. When she too. said, yeah, well, I, the, no, that's a different story. But anyway, um, the first person that she called, the one that was 99 years old, when she told him what she was looking for, and they hung up on her, and then they took all the genia, uh, the DNA stuff down off the computer, that made my heart hurt. I mean, that's, to me, that piques my interest of, like, what do they know? How do they know? You know, that gets my Nancy Drew feelers up. But it could be absolutely nothing, but still it's suspicious to me. Yeah, and, and I, me, me and Cece talked about this too. We do think with this being released in the film, uh, of course your conspiracy theorists, not, not you, I'm just saying yeah. in general, are going to think that that person pulling that DNA had something to do with it. She's just pointing out the facts that actually happened. Uh, but at the same time, just in general, uh, African Americans don't really want to cooperate with the right. police because it hurts them in the long ter- in the long term, <laughs> as opposed to helping them. So it it could, right. yeah, it could be totally an uh, unrelated right. issue. And and she even says in the film, as you all, as you all know, that yes, this person was related, but th- they may not have even known they were right. related. Like like she, she thinks it's a, a misattribution as as to this little girl was probably being raised by a cousin or an in-law as opposed to an actually family member. So those who are actually related to her may not even have known she existed. Right. And she said that she's solved over 220 cases now. And we're hoping that uh, this one is the next one. And she, she saw four, she saw four since that. Oh, really? It's amazing. It's amazing. She's the hero we need, really. That's why, really, this Seriously. case should be solved. It's a no-brainer. The, going back to the very beginning where the police thought this would be super easy. I mean, it's a little girl in a vacant building. You would think that this would be pretty simple. Um, I made notes that the, the lady next door lived there and operated a candy store. So there were people coming in and out, and nobody saw anything. Right. And the the front door was boarded up, but the back one was open. But still, you wouldn't see somebody carrying something and then not carrying it as they left. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And and with the, the pictures I'm introducing are actual crime scene pictures. So if people look at them, a lot of the YouTube store stories that are out there are going to fall apart at this point. So the front door is locked up. And the back stairwells collapsed. You can't climb it, but it's also boarded up for the upstairs area. So these boys weren't climbing inside floor by floor trying to look for something. The back door is six stairs right down. They just went right into the basement, you know. So there was no access inside the building to get to the basement. You would have had to come out and go down. So it just, uh, I, I just hope that the regurgitation that YouTubers had of giving each other's information, they at least take take a breath and and hear how, because it, it's funny when you listen to them, they all say, well, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. Well, here's why it doesn't make sense. And, you know, it's just exploring those things. Yeah, I was watching this last night and my husband's like, I was telling him a little bit and he goes, oh, but they found her killer. And I'm like, no, they don't know who we, she is. And they're like, well, why don't they, why don't they know who she is? And I'm like, she doesn't have a head. There's no head. Her head has never been found. She doesn't have a face. There's no way to recognize her without a face. You can't go to somebody and say, who is this person? You know, you can't find a name without a face. And so this whole DNA, we're just praying that that comes through. What surprised you? Yeah, yeah. She had mentioned the sweater having having blood on it. So the body was drained of blood somewhere else. So the sweater, the blood had pooled. If you look, look at the sweater, it had pooled because the body was laying on a piece of wood. That's why it goes down the center of the sweater 
because the, the body, the residual blood that was on all went to the pooling of the wood. So that's why it's in that that direction. But yeah, that could have yielded some DNA, definitely some probably some offender DNA as well. I mean, it, it also, really could have. Good- but at the time, blood typing was the thing, not DNA. Right. Also, let's talk about that stray white pubic hair that they thought maybe from a police officer. <laughs> Call me crazy, yeah. but mm, I don't know about that. Yeah. Uh, the detective on that, he seemed kind of, uh, he didn't want to go into that, is what it looked like to me. Because I even have that written down. That a pubic hair it- from white Caucasian <laughs> sounds like they know whose it could be, and it definitely was a mistake. That's what it looked like. That's my ob- observation from the film. This whole case could have been nine episodes uh-huh. and went down a whole lot of right. lot of rabbit holes. It really, it really could have. But with that, so on the scene, it was a white pubic hair, and actually, Doctor Carter, even even though I cut it out, she makes she makes note of that. She's like, "This is a black child, and there's a white hair that's found." But I think the clear point of it is the hair, which has never been known, but is clear, the hair was found at the morgue not okay. on the scene but i think it's always interpreted that it was found on the scene and it wasn't it was believed to have been an officer at the scene that was thrown out as a possibility yeah. by the newspaper the what i was surprised to learn is that they reused body bags so in transporting her body uh-huh. bag to the morgue this could have been a pubic hair that had got on her in 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 the body bag. So that's probably the the biggest theory about that hair. <laughs> but because it was Caucasian and because of the nature of the crime and the area, they just didn't believe that their offender, the the high probability of their offender was, was white. And again, that's mm-hmm. a sign of the times. It, 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 it really was because we all know now and today an offender can be any color. It doesn't matter. The, they don't see, they see the age mm-hmm. of the child. They don't see black, white, boy, girl. They just see the age of the child. And, and what's, cra- what's crazy too is that uh, the Green River Killer, the St. Louis Police Department actually flew to him and interviewed him in 1983 before he was even known to be a serial killer because of this case. Wow. So I thought even though I didn't introduce, I didn't introduce that in because the same way you don't with the whole mm-hmm. Vernon Brown thing, nobody believes it's Vernon Brown at all. But it keeps getting re- regurgitated. And the reason Vernon Brown came in, the only reason is that in the the limited database they had back in the eighties, they would have to type in, uh, I guess, kind of like you do a wide search. So they typed in fifty six hundred because this was at. Uh, 5635 Clemens, and he lived at 5600 Goodfellow. So because his address just happened to be at the 5600 is the reason why he got pulled in. Now, he actually 
he actually owned up to another killing he did, but he never admitted anything to do with this. I And it, it just doesn't fit him. People like to make it fit, but the officers don't believe it was him as well. I, I know that there's an interview with Tom Carroll. I didn't speak to Tom Carroll where he said, I believe he did it, but that could have been in the heat of the moment, but I didn't speak to Tom Carroll, but he's the only officer that that made that statement. So it's not the police that believe Vernon Brown did it. It was Carroll at that particular moment. We normally don't discuss theories on here. Um, sometimes it just doesn't. Yeah, likewise. Do very good. But do you think they are close to knowing who may have done this or or even identifying suspect that sweet baby as far as uh and i i don't i don't like the theories either that's why i was trying to point holes in some right. of the ones that were out there but as you know in the film i don't introduce right. any theory everything is checked by the police or a doctor or anything but uh i do believe in my heart as far as identification that they're within two years I think it really, I think it really is just the right person researching their family tree. I, I really do. Now, as far as the actual killer, if they find out who it is, I do believe it's, it, in my opinion, again, just it, it's probably somebody related to her. So I think if they identify her, the killer will probably be known shortly after because because of that so and and i will say that in talking to people about the film i always wondered why this hadn't been like a, a movie or something like that and it was kind of told to me that uh because of the decapitation and because of the high pride uh the, the high probability that this is a family member is why they never wanted to make it into a film because in the in the climate of the 80s and 90s that wasn't where uh, movies were going, that it was going to be a family rape and decapitation. Hmm. So Wow. So police are actually fairly certain or seem to be that it is a family member that caused this, that's responsible for her death. Well, they, 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 always, they always conclude by saying, but it could be anybody. It, it really could and be. And it anybody. could. But I think that I do believe that, yeah, that it, that's the over, uh, overwhelming majority thought is that it, it's uh, if not a family member somebody linked to that family to to her in a close way which makes sense because it, normally it is right i mean when we go look at other cases that have been solved it is a family member or someone on the close outskirts of the family someone that they know do you believe that she was originally from st louis or do you think she is and brought up here or do you think I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying my sentence right. Do you right, think she right, was right, actually right. brought yeah, here yeah, to yeah, St. Louis, or do you think she's from St. Louis? Well, that that's an avenue. I know we when we spoke at the crime con, I'm, that that I, I don't want to get into, but I'll say I believe she's from the Midwest. Okay. Uh, with with it within a few hours, I'll say. I'd agree. So if, if the, I I can't say you know. Well, it would have to be somebody in the area that would know that building or know that area or they somebody had to know somebody who knew that area. Because didn't you say in the documentary that that house or that building had only been vacant for maybe seven years? Oh, it was less than that, I think. And Except like 78, five years, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the crime was 83. Yeah, yeah. But, well, the yeah, 78 is the last known actual paying tenant, but the people in the community told me they remember people living there to like 81. Yeah. So there could have been people living in a in a, in a condemned vacant building, you That's know, true. up until 81. Smatters. But uh, when we're off here, uh -huh. I'm going to throw something else to, to uh -huh. you guys too that you can look at, but nothing I'm going to put on here. I love getting a secret we'll keep But I can also say it... <laughs> Yeah, this uh, this building could look could have looked similar to another building. Oh, and I'll leave oh, it. At and that. that that's a good. That, this is a good question for this because I know John John Walsh's son Adam. Um, I believe he was decapitated and his head and not his body was found. But as far as St. Louis goes, um, is there? 
just for for example, I I was working in news when Angie Houseman was murdered, and right after that was Cassidy Center, and like the whole St. Louis went crazy because they're like, "There's a killer on the loose." Well, it was soon proved they found Cassidy's killer. And so, was there any sort of like other crime similar to this at that time that happened? Because I don't I don't remember anything happening like this. Yes. So uh, a year prior. Uh, I'm not going to throw names at you, but you could definitely look this up. Uh, so in the south side of St. Louis, there was a little girl who, uh, there was a guy, an African-American gentleman who lived in like a boarding room. And he ended up killing a little girl on the way back from a carnival. And uh, her body was found in a vacant building in a closet Uh I can't remember if she was decapitated, but it, everything was similar, but maybe the decapitation. And that was that was one year prior on the South Side. However, he was incarcerated during this time. And then there's also the case a year later, there's a, a decapitation of a Caucasian little boy, 10 years old, that turned out to be his uncle. That did it? So... There were decapitations in the area. Yeah, yeah, that did it. He was captured, but again, that's but see, that, that's telling right there because his uncle probably decapitated that little boy with the hopes that they wouldn't be able to identify him, and there, which would be very similar to this. So a relative of hers did this in an effort to avoid Absolutely. capture or detection. Oh, another thing that I thought was really sad: um, the detective that went on Oprah in 1990. And he was one amongst, I forgot how many, but they were all brought in to discuss all these cold cases. And every single one of them have been solved except this one. That just, it broke my heart. I just feel like this poor little girl has been left behind and just, I, I don't know. It's always played a part of my heart and it just needs to. Well, I think it's time. It's solved. And I think, too. It is. 40 years? The, uh, somebody knows something. I, I don't know how you could commit this. I, obviously, that person c- could not have been clean You're you're after doing that. I just would think that somebody would know something, even if they didn't really realize they knew it. Like your uncle came home late and was disheveled or something. I, until somebody speaks like that, I guess, you know. Because she had to have been killed and decapitated at a different yeah. part. Because if she didn't have a lot of blood, mm-hmm. the, there wasn't a lot of blood on the scene. So she had to be mm-hmm. carried in. It looks like there was blood on the walls that they think. That, now, yeah. did you go into how they thought the blood got on the walls of the, the stone walls? Yeah. So. Yeah. So. In in research leading up to this, and from what I read, it said that there were streaks on the wall. Then I, I watched some YouTube videos, and they always say it's on the stairwell going down to the Hitchcock, Hitchcockian basement theme <laughs> and all of that. But uh, really, it's outside of the doorway where they turned the body to drop it. So they just bumped mm-hmm. it against the wall. And honestly, if you watch Burgoon's interview... You can see him mentally showing you where it's at. He's like, they bumped it against mm-hmm. the wall. And if you look at his his hand marks, they're in line with those bumps on that wall. So that's actual crime scene photo that's never been seen as well, uh, is where the blood actually was. So that, that, in my opinion, should change the narrative a lot because it definitely wasn't on the stairwell. And it really wasn't a stairwell. It was six yeah. steps. You, right. you know what I mean? So, And I even show a similar building showing you that because again, there was so much misinformation. I just needed to hone it in to, so everybody understood that what was being fed to us was by people who didn't even do the research, you know, like the, the, we haven't brought it up yet, but the spina bifida thing. Oh yeah. So that turned out being, uh, yeah, that turned out, I'm sorry, go ahead. I don't remember spina bifida. I don't remember if I put that in the podcast or not. That just totally, I never heard of that part before, or I don't think I have. My memory is poor. Late 90s when web sleuthing became a thing, pardon me. Some web sleuth 
got up in their mind she had spina bifida occulta. <clears throat> so there was a case in 1985 in Belleville, Illinois, that had a kid with spina bifida in it. So we believe that the attribute they attributed those two cases wrongly together in the news. So it's reported that an anthropologist found during the autopsy that, that she had spina bifida occulta. You two ladies have a copy of the uh, autopsy. It is not in there at, at all. That would be one of the things and, uh, that would stick out. I'm I asked sure. Burgoon. Absolutely. And I asked Burgoon, I'm like, and he's like, no. And you see it in the interview. He, mm-hmm. He's like, no, that somebody kind of made that up. And what I'm proud of on that point is that uh, the Doe Network has actually corrected the fact on their page and it said even though it was widely reported she did not have spina bifida and they actually list my film as that source so i'm, I'm proud of that Good to help you. correct her history speaking so, of which let's get the correct title plug in right here because i think we might have forgot to say that at the top of the show what's the name of it's this called film? our precious hope revisited and then the, the tagline is the St. Louis Little Jane Doe. It's going to be on Amazon Prime Video. And it's also going to be available on uh, a new streaming service, which is uh, Momitu, which just launched in August. Uh, it, it's, uh, to my knowledge, like Tubi, but for the entire North America, meaning Mexico, Canada, and the United States. So it's free. You can download it and it'll be available there as well. And what's it called again? It's Momitu, M-O-M-E-T-U. Now, we know that this was, I guess, more than a labor of love. It becomes almost like an obsession when you're doing this because, and thankfully, all of this fell fell in line for you. Um, Who would you like to say thank you to for helping, I guess, this all come together and help you out? Because I'm sure when you first told people, they're like, yeah, right. And you're like, nope, I'm going to do it. Watch me. And you really did. Yeah. I uh, I do want to say that I I put out something that was an hour long first, uh, like, like uh, almost a year ago. And that got me more and more information where I pulled it back. That's why this is called Revisited. So there's only about, uh, there's only some of the interviews that were in that that's still in this, but the other one is gone. You'll never even find that anymore and uh but those i'd like to thank is definitely everybody that that worked in the interview you know from burgoon mclenn uh dr carter cc moore abby you know everybody that interviewed also you know even though they they may get a bad rap or whatever the st louis police department because from the minute they found out I was going to do this, and they found out early, like within the first two weeks of me even deciding to do it, they they weren't against it. They were dealing with, because uh, at first they were going to do even more interviews, but the mayor in St. Louis had changed. And they didn't know what the, the climate of the new mayor was going to be like, so they, they needed to, to dial back a little bit. But once they saw how far I got, you know, they just they just start falling in line more and more. I will say I'd like to thank the St. Louis medical examiners because there were things I I was able to help them locate that they didn't know existed, but they had and were able to find and and put back into the record. So that was, had I not asked those questions where these are at, they wouldn't have asked the right person who was getting ready to retire (laughs) where it was. So well, just uh, definitely the Whitfield Foundation. Um, keep going. <laughs> oh, the Whit, the, yeah, the Whit, the, Whit, the the Whitfield Foundation is where we did a uh, a bunch of the interviews as well. So they let us use their facility mm-hmm. for some of the backdrops. What about your video audio crew that helped you? I'm winking at you right now, Bird. If you can't see, who who did your beautiful <laughs> video and Absol- audio work? Yeah, ab- absolutely. So. Uh, the main two that helped me were uh, a guy I alluded to earlier, Romeo Austin, and my and my daughter Shelby. You met both Shelby! of them. That's what I was uh, waiting for. At, at the, at the I was like, time. you better not <laughs> see her without Absolutely. thanking her. 
I, I couldn't for real. They they did a lot, you know. Shelby traveled with me up to Chicago to do the interview. Lee did every Lee was did that pretty much everything. You know, he flew the drone. My cousin Brian flew the drone. They they helped film. Uh, I let them try to organize uh, interviews and stuff to get them ready for their next projects and everything too. So it was it was great. I mean, it really was, and it wasn't that I didn't want to thank them. I appreciate you for reminding me to bring them up. They're, they're probably going to I was, I was just teasing you because I just remember when you introduced me yeah. at the thing, I was like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. Because that's not, I mean, it's hard to do good video and sound. It's not the easiest. So, um, Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and you could tell from, you could tell from the first interview that I did on there, the growth we made as a team by the last interview, you could mm -hmm. see you know, the, the the clarity differences and things like that. So we were growing as a staff. Like I said, I, I had no experience. My daughter graduated from UMSL and uh, with, with and that's what she studied in communication. Me too. Video. Yeah, oh, I graduated from UMSL too, but in criminology. So, oh, well. <laughs> but uh, when I graduated from UMSL in 04, it was, uh, it was uh, the number three crim uh, criminal justice school in yeah. the nation. So, but my degrees in criminology were uh, offenders offend. Mm -hmm. So I guess they kind of help. This is the only thing I've ever done with that degree. <laughs> yeah, but look at it. You have an Amazon Prime movie. That's, I would yeah. say that's, and I think you've moved this case a lot forward, forward with, well, you know, not, it's so old. You got a lot of stuff that, and that surprised me in my head. I know what I'm saying and it makes sense, but and Jen knows. <laughs> well, I think what's awesome is you've stopped the folklore you yeah i see behind you the little her little pink and white dress that's heartbreaking um the you've stopped the folklore that has gone along you've stopped you've you've brought more of a everything truth. the truth you brought the truth out right because like you said the youtubers and everybody covering the case was focusing on things that weren't true and even the cops were just like, yeah, let's just let it go that the psychic lost it, you know, and when actually it was actually somebody in their own department. And yeah, it, it's, it's a good thing that you've done. It's a great thing that you've done. And we thank you for it. So anything else you want to add? Yeah, I wanted to just, if, if you haven't seen the film yet, you, you will see actual crime scene photos of the body so you will see a decapitation I, I just want to put that on there either as interest or warning to you because some people may not want to see that but I, I felt it was important to the case now there is another video there is another photo that you will only see sections of uh these two ladies have that photo uh it's, it's i just didn't it's, feel that photo was appropriate nightmare. So. It's nightmare. Yeah, when you yeah. when no. you explained it to me, because I'm trying to tread lightly here, you don't really know what you're looking at. And when you explained it to me, I about fell over. So uh yeah. Yeah. It took me a minute and then I went once I realized it was yeah, nightmare fuel. Yeah. But so and I will also say on another on another photo. So for those that that doubt anything Dr. Carter says about this rape. There is a photo, it's not in the film, but it does exist, and these ladies know it does, where you can actually see the damaged lower extremities protruding from the body. So there is evidence in a photo that, that what she's saying is true. There's no words for that. I can't. That's no. animalistic. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. To we that. always talk about monsters, but this person that did this is literally. And I just can't believe they've never been found. I just can't believe it. But I really think the key is, is finding her identity. And then that, you know, that'll bring you to where she lives, who she hung out with, who she was being raised by. And there's a whole bunch of suspects right there. Last person she was seen with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She needs her name. And I hope bird that you are one that helps give her the name. That would be amazing. Talk about a, it would. that's all you need to do in life right there. 
Um, so do you want to tell us again the full name of the movie and when it, it's slated to premiere on Amazon Prime? Now, remember, sometimes those things can change. And of course, we'll update you as we get a little bit closer. But you want to go ahead and tell everybody again? Absolutely. So the name of it is Our Precious Hope Revisited, St. Louis's Little Jane Doe. Uh, it is scheduled for release right now on Amazon Prime in September. It is listed on the, the IMDb page as September 15th, but much like you said, I, I think Amazon kind of does it when they want, you, you know what I mean? So it, it it should be around that time, one week or the other, but it, but it's scheduled for September this month. And, and Momitu, the one I was mentioning, that is uh, scheduled for uh, this month as well. I think they'll follow suit with Prime on the release. Is there anything else you want to add? Anything that you want our listeners or um, anybody that watches the movie, which I also, let me add, I really, really like the way you had, I guess the transitions with the questions, because in my head, those are the things I'm thinking and you put it up there and then they would answer that your interviewees, which I loved. I thought that was amazing, but is there anything else you want to add? Yeah, I, I could add that right there. So in again, like being new to this and researching films, uh, I saw a, fi a film, and I'm not plugging it, but I, I did see a film by a guy, and the name of the film was 77 Minutes. I don't know if you all have seen it, but it's about, uh, in, uh, I believe it was San Diego, there was some murders that happened in the 80s at a McDonald's, and mm -hmm. this guy got the crime scene footage, and he just keeps showing these murders over and over, but yet, as I watched it, I saw him in his face more than I saw, you, you know, anybody he interviewed. And then I read the reviews and it was like, well, you know, he's director and this. So I just didn't want to put my voice on it when the story is not about yeah. me at I, all. You know, it's about the little girl. I loved it. I, so I thought that was genius. That, it did keep the focus on the information too. I appreciate that. Yeah, Absolutely. Well and then, like I said, I do appreciate it. I, I just, I really... I know I already said it, but I really want to just say it again. Everything in this film is vetted and signed off on by a doctor, a policeman, or a genetic genealogist. Like even down to, which we didn't mention, but I actually show how the decapitation occurred. So you can see the, the cuts and where they were. And, and that came with working with Dr. Carter and the police, and they're both and it came down to this is what is being described. So it's not actually her x-ray, but it's what's described in the autopsy. Now, x-rays do exist, but they don't know where they are. They're with that yellow sweater. There's a lot that came up missing. They don't know where the Yeah, they don't know where they don't know where the swabs went, but they were probably absorbed. They don't know they're missing six slats that were supposedly taken. And um uh, I'm even going to put this out there. So the green paint that has never been known. Yep. And, and it, it, they list it now and that was in the autopsy, but it's never been put out that there, there was some type of green paint paint put into uh, the striations. And uh, in the interview with Mary Case, she said that she submitted that section to the, to the police and the police were like, man, we, we never saw that. So it's never even been mentioned anywhere. So there's a there's a disconnect there uh, on that the green paint. But I will say, so you were talking about the mold test. I think this is important, especially for the YouTubers that are only going to talk about your podcast and not watch the film. Please do... The the mold test has never been revealed till now. I was the first one to get that as well. And so Dr. Carter says that, you know, this is some type of a meat cleaver or, or something like that. Even though Dr. Case says it's a long weapon to make striations. But in the actual mold report that's done by the Botanical Garden and St. Louis University, it says that there is a fungus found within the mold that only occurs in uh, animal meat. So that would mean whatever it was used to cut her head off had previously been used to slice meat within a few hours. I'm not saying it was a butcher, 
mm-hmm. but it right. could have been somebody cooking dinner no, or, or, or something like that. But it, that's where my mind went. I, I, I said that was no, that, that's my mind went to that, that that's somebody's kitchen knife. That's somebody's knife. And just grabbed I mean, you it wouldn't, and took it out with them. You know, it could have been more than one utensil. Like they could have grabbed the knife to, to begin cutting the skin and it wasn't enough. And they could have hacked at the neck because Dr. Carter made it clear. He's like, hey, this isn't TV. It's mm-hmm. not going to be one hit and the head's mm-hmm. off, you know, and the decapitation does come from the back forward. It doesn't, it doesn't go this way. It comes from the back forward. Mm-hmm. Did the police move buildings or anything <laughs> that they might've left, uh, like misplaced the sweater somewhere when they moved? Like it's probably under somebody else's well, case. That, I, was, or I was just going to ask, at, have, have they ever at, done like a clean sweep of the evidence room to find this stuff? It has to be there. It doesn't right. walk away. Cause it seems like they are missing so much from this case. Um, and I'm sure it happens in more cases than we'd like to think, but it just seems that so much is missing, you know, am I wrong? Yeah. So it's my, well, it, to, an, to answer your question, police headquarters did move from hmm. 1200 Clark street over to Olive. So it has moved in the interim, but it, it's my understanding that the person who, who worked in the mail room that signed for it, isn't a police officer. It is somebody that works for the police department. So they would have signed for it, but not necessarily known where to take it or put it. So that's where it could have been lost. But your, your question is great because we haven't even talked about this. Like everybody goes it like the news made it a big thing about, oh, they have a room designated now for uh, St. Louis Jane Doe, which they do. But the purpose of that room was so that stuff would stop coming up missing Mm -hmm. and and just walking away and it wasn't even known until this film that the fbi actually digitized all their information because it was falling apart for them so all that's now in 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 a room secured because it's just deteriorating so and stuff's coming up missing i think so yeah after 40 years yeah we i covered another case at the beginning of this our beginning of our podcast where the room flooded and they lost the room of evidence for this case. And they went to take all the evidence out and all the evidence got misplaced when they brought it back in. I mean, it was it's um, horrible. So that's why I wanted to know if that something like that happened, because that would make sense other than just things disappear. Well, I will say that some of the cops I worked with that aren't on the case anymore are, some of the ones that gave me some of the photos and other things. So there are cops out there that, that have stuff that walked away on this, from this case that, that were able to give it to me. And I were, was able to give a couple of those things back to the police, you know, not the original, mm-hmm. of course, but, but so that right. they had that information as, as well. But I, I'll throw something at you all that I didn't know until I did this either, that this may help out in some of your future ones. So prior to 2017, uh, when Sean Dace took over uh, Homicide, he's the one that actually changed this. So some of the policemen that worked the cases before told me that uh, when a when a homicide detective would either quit or get fired, that their cases weren't reassigned. They were just set on a shelf and the other detectives in their free time were supposed to pick them up and start working on them. So imagine, what? imagine your, your husband getting, ki- getting killed today, the detectives assigned and then fired tomorrow. Now no one's actively working this case, Unbelievable. you know? So like, I was, I was shocked, but I was shocked by that. Yeah. So, wow. but it, but it has changed again since 2017. Thank God. Think about how yeah, many cases yeah. that, since that, 2017. When I brought that up to, yeah, since 2017, I brought that up. I brought that up <laughs> to uh, McGlynn that I had heard this from former detectives, and uh, he actually wanted to go back later in the interview and touch back on that to to kind of clarify what was happening and everything. So, hmm. so yeah, I didn't know that. Just like I didn't know the the whole body bag. Like like I don't know how I didn't know that. It, it never reoccurred to me that they would reuse the body bag, but. I know it doesn't surprise me either, you know, but it just, I never thought it of it. It can't be that expensive so, though. I mean, just ugh. and talk about cross contamination. If you're a lazy employee, you don't clean it out very well. Ooh. 
I was going to say you all, I, I know, and I didn't, I didn't in the film. And uh, uh, I know you all don't talk about speculation or anything like that, but I did want to throw a, a question out to you all. And again, I hope people don't take anything from this, but I'm throwing a question out. Just chatting. So Sharon just chatting, Cole right? went missing. Go ahead. Sorry. Just, just chatting. So Sharon Cole mm-hmm. went missing in New York on February 25th, 2000. I mean, excuse me, February 25th, 1983. Mm-hmm. Three days before St. Louis Jane Doe was found. It could have been one of the days that she was discarded. Now, she has been genetically ruled out. DNA does not match. It's not Sharon Cole. But when Sharon Cole went missing, she had a gold sweater on. So could our killer possibly have heard that on the news and said, well, I'll put a yellow sweater on her just to throw the police off without a head they won't know? That's a good idea, too, because she wasn't found with anything else. And if you said she, uh, she was That's... from New York, which would lead me to believe maybe... I don't truck driver, somebody going across country and that. And then, you know what I mean? Same perpetrator, different victim. Hmm. I don't know. Since we started doing this podcast, sometimes the things that you never think about. It depends on if the, uh, the suspect is smart enough to even put those together. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't even know it was brutal. Maybe it was a spur of the moment thing that, Maybe he was brutalizing her. I, I think this killer is, I think of people by introducing Vernon Brown have, have subconsciously had people think that this killer isn't smart. I think this killer is above and beyond smart. And the, re, the reason I, I say that is because there's no other blood on the scene. Mm-hmm. Like there are elements to this that, that are just, I won't say genius, but above an average criminal's thought pattern, you know, of how I'm going to dispose of this body, what what I'm going to choose to leave, how I'm going to choose to leave it. And, and also, you know, I think a lot of people think this was done overnight, you, you know, in the middle of the night. I, I believe in disposing this body, it was probably early morning. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, when when there is movement and in and out, and if that back door is open, chances are people were in and out of that basement. It wasn't just these kids, you know what I mean? So I, I don't think this is something that happened in the night. Also, we didn't we didn't mention this, but the um, Dr. Joy, my new hero, mentioned that there were no scars or injuries indicating that uh, Precious, Precious Doe had not been previously abused. Yes, true. Uh, the the there was an indentation on her chest, but that came from the board she was laying on. Mm-hmm. Uh, scars, but but you got you, you, and that's a, not something else that's put out there a lot. But you got to take that for what it actually is saying. Previously abused, mm-hmm. it's not saying she wasn't oh, yeah. abused at that moment. Oh yeah. So so there just wasn't anything. There wasn't anything that was showing signs of healing. But there were signs of abuse. Interesting. When you said that there wasn't sign of previous, but there was sign of abuse, the abuse of what she sh- suffered at that moment, right before death, is what you're speaking of, correct? Okay. Yeah. yeah yes. Yes. A- a- absolutely. Because, uh, because uh, uh, again, and it, this is just because I want there. There's so I know I've said this a lot, and I apologize, but there's so much bad information out there that. Mm-hmm we need to re- reconnect back what's true. And, and, and so many people are, are saying, oh, she was well taken care of. She was beaten. Mm-hmm. She was raped. You know, well taken care of is meaning up until a week ago. It's not meaning at that particular moment. Like like mm-hmm. the severity of what she went through, I think is just glassed over a lot. Like, yeah, the decapitation is what made it. No, no, she was strangled. She was beaten. She was mm-hmm. raped. This was tragic. It wasn't. It wasn't. I I don't know. I I just I don't think that that it's done justification to what she mm-hmm. went through. Like like 
it was horrible. I mean, it, it, it really was. And I think had it been reported that horrible at the time, I do believe maybe there would have been a bigger effort to, to find mm-hmm. what was going on. I mean, I, I'll throw this out there uh, that she, even though the FBI made a quote the day this happened, that this is the worst crime scene of a child in St. Louis history, she ends up on page four of the newspaper. Yeah. Not only that, the, the news that evening, she wasn't even the number one story. Her story didn't come up until after the first commercial break. Do you know what led the first few minutes of, of the, the news that night? February 28th, 1983 was the last day that MASH aired. Oh. So it was all about MASH. It wasn't MASH even about her. the decapitation of a little African-American girl. Unreal. Yep. Wow. That's I mean, true. That, 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 I forgot about that in your film. I forgot about that. It took that long for that story. And I think today, I think we've come a long way since 1983 in reporting news, especially of children and the how we have to be quick if they're disappeared. Sorry, my cat. Really? She's all over me. Um, that they get that out there more. But And I would think today that they would be better about running that on the news and getting it out there a lot quicker. I would hope. I would hope so. I, I do. Let me, I do want to throw one other thing out, out to you all uh, real quick. And I'm sorry I'm going, I could talk about this case all day long. I, mean, I researched this no, for almost two we're years. Good. So oh, I told you, it's like, you know, uh, this is so baby. There, Come here. Absolutely. So there, there's a quote that's out there that everybody always talks about. And the quote is that uh, it was too cold even for reps. Hey, have you all heard that yeah. in your research about this? Mm-hmm. I heard there was a very chilly. Yeah, and they went in. Yeah, but do you, but and I yeah, and, and I just thought, oh, that's cool and stuff like that. But do you do you know where that comes from? Like like with this case, it's because there mm-hmm. because the mold was solid on her neck, and there were no rat nibblings around her neck. Oh. Doctor Joy Carter told me that, and I'm like, I like I never even knew rats ate on a body like that. She said, yeah, but the. One of the things that surprised her was the lack of rodent activity on the body. And and one thing I want to say about Joy Carter is she actually graduated med school in 83 and went and did her forensic stuff in Miami during the 80s, during the cocaine wars. So she's seen quite a few decapitated bodies. So mm. she's somebody that knew what she was looking for. You know what I mean? So, But yeah, I never even thought about rats eating at a neck. I didn't. Sorry to gross you out with that. I just no. That's that's fine. That's it. Just hurts. <laughs> you know. That's yeah. that baby. It's um. Yeah, I was going to ask something, but now my mind is totally cleared. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do I, have to I apologize. No, no, bird. That's fine. I just I wasn't. That came totally out of left field for me. So good. Re- remember, I had to try to go to sleep with this I, at night. I know, Honestly, I know. I know. I don't know how you did it. And especially like going down this hole for two years and being obsessed with it and knowing way more than any human should have to know about something so despicable. Um, so do you believe that I lost my train of thought there because of the rats? I kept thinking about the rats too, Jen. <laughs> I know. No, I know. It was good. Uh shoot. Well, my question, I know we don't do theories, but I always thought, going back to you, she was so well taken care of. I always thought that she was taken care of up until the point, and then something happened. Either she had to go to a family member's house, or she was kidnapped and taken, and then that's when the abuse started. So I, that was always my theory, that she was kidnapped, basically, because nobody has come forward claiming oh. like nobody around this area would ever say that they were missing a child the police looked everywhere for a missing child and nothing so that was my theory so when we said she was well taken care of she was up until possibly that day or that week right am i correct in assuming that or is uh, that no no i i have i agree with that wholeheartedly my whole thing is in, in in hearing and again youtubers and 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 blogs and web sleuth they they overemphasize how she was like taken care of and all of that 
But what are they basing that on? The only thing you have to base that on is that she wasn't malnourished Mm. and there were no bruises of previous abuse on her body. You don't know what her lifestyle was, but when you, when you try to make it seem that way, you're, you're pushing people down a path like with the spina bifida thing. Now you may have the person who's related to her thinking, well, my sister is missing, but she Mm -hmm. didn't have spina bifida. Mm -hmm. So it can't be her or, well, you know, my sister, it had an eating disorder. She was skinny, but you, you know, so it can't be her, but I just want, I just want to be more mindful of the stuff that they're making up because there's a lot of stuff that that's out there that's made up and I'll, I'll comment prior to this film coming out. I would get frustrated reading some of the stuff that was out there and I would come back with some information, not rude, but just, you know, this isn't right. Or, or this was that. And, I actually, uh, I actually got kicked off of web uh because because of the information that they, you had cracked. Uh, so and they my did rebuttal not. to them was, you, you, yeah, you don't, you don't want the real information. You would rather have somebody say, "Hey, I think it's this," than somebody saying, "Well, this occurred because of this." And yeah, but they kicked me off. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and you know, but, with the wrong yeah, information, even the height th- that that's you know. That could be, well, my sister was really short. She wasn't 5'5", five yeah. five or whatever they said at first. Um, and then also that there was a minute that they exactly. thought maybe she was indigenous, Native American. And, you know, that's so then if your child's black and missing, <laughs> right? You go, oh, not mine. Well, wrong. So I, I the right information is crucial to finding out who she is. My uh, my research of Meriwether I was t- telling you about. So the, what you're talking about with the with uh, uh, Native Americans, uh, we actually talked to the lady that of the mother of the daughter who Sharon Nolte thought was killed by the person. So she she left us like, she didn't want to speak on interview, but she left us like seven five minute voicemails. And, and we, we have those, but she, did, she, she didn't even know what Sharon Nolte was talking about because she didn't even believe it. But then I asked uh, one of the detectives, I'll tell you all who were off because they really didn't want to be quoted like that. But uh, he told me that they went down this this avenue to see, and I guess up in Minnesota and Canada, there's like a big Indian po- uh, population up there. And there's a school they go to that they found that there's like a 10 to 20 kids that really did go missing and they found their bodies like 50 so that was an avenue they just didn't want to go down yeah 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 so yeah so that was crazy to me and then he he, they knew again they already got the genetic stuff working so they know that it's african-american but they don't want to really put anything else out but he said their leads are like a big pizza that's cut into a different slice and if you pull any one of them you're just pulling the cheese on the pizza and i asked that to mcglynn and mcglynn's like if they really even are leaves he's just like they're all rabbit holes every single one just takes you in another direction like it, it, it's crazy just one other last thing that's always bugged me and i know that there's a reason for it but missing a child no no rec- no reports of a missing child. Now, do you think that's because um, it was a different time and they couldn't get that out fast enough? Um, For instance, like today we have the computer. So if somebody goes missing in Ottawa, Canada, we find out about it the same time that people in Ottawa, Canada do. So do you think that that was just the case back in 1983 that maybe somebody from say Arkansas, Pennsylvania, Florida, their daughter's missing, but they're not making that connection because it's not up here. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, what Burgoon told me. Uh, so Burgoon told me working this case, what the biggest challenge was, and you don't even have to go that far away, uh, that the police in different communities didn't work with each other. So you, you, you think you're solving a murder or a, a, a kidnapping ring in Belleville, Illinois. So you want to be the one to solve it. So you don't tell the St. Louis police the information. So they don't even know that there is a possibly a serial killer or rapist working in the area that they could probably link some too. So I think if the police worked together back then, a lot of this could have been solved. And also like 
that you see on TV, there's all these rape kits in these cities that haven't been Tested. processed. Mm-hmm. Like, like imagine the, the, the rapists that could have been caught that are passed away. You know what I mean? Well, and that's what Dr. Joy says, right? That look at all the rapists and then he escalated to murder, correct? Wasn't that what she was saying? Yep. Either he escalated to murder or this was the only murder because of uh, his his close relationship Mm -hmm. to this child. And that would make sense because I don't, if he went to prison, not only are you murdering a child, but you're murdering your child relative. So I would be... I would not think that he would admit that, you know, it's one thing to be in jail for rape. It's another for rape and the murder of a child. So if he did only commit one, unless he makes a deathbed confession, I don't think he would admit to it. Well, I would guarantee it's somebody in that area and had to have known about that house because it's so close. Everything around there, you wouldn't have known that the back door, I don't know, or he would have had scouted out ahead of time. But it was somebody in the area. That's my feeling on it. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see. I could definitely see that too. And that's why I felt it in the film. It was I had to at least show where the hospital was in location to this, mm-hmm. being just a couple blocks away, so that you know, because I know there's going to be people thinking, well, maybe they were on their way to the hospital. Something happened, so they decided to dispose of the body. But but the hospital literally is right there. If if you were trying to get help for this child, there's a place mm-hmm. to get it within yeah. two blocks. You, you know what I mean? Right. So free. they weren't trying to get help for this child. Yeah, right. free. Absolutely yeah. free. Well, and so. I think the fact that he killed her, I keep saying he, they killed her elsewhere. I think there was no saving. He, he knew what he was doing. Maybe, I, I don't know. I was going to speculate, but I won't. Yeah, and I don't even, I don't even think your questions are... Uh, speculation you, you, you know you you guys are, are making educated conclusions are, are you're interjecting into a conversation that needs mm-hmm. to be had you know we need we need to start having new conversations about what could have occurred as opposed to just keep saying the stuff we know now didn't happen if that mm-hmm. makes sense mm-hmm. well well the person was smart enough to um drain her blood and not leave a trail or maybe that just was a now i i, I just keep thinking about the yellow sweater too that maybe that wasn't even her yellow sweater right originally i know but that would make sense That's because what, that, where's her and yeah. i guess they've never found her socks shoes or pants anywhere no and i don't you know, again, we don't want to bring speculation mm-hmm. in anything like that, but I, I think that is one of the biggest questions. I, I really do doubt if that was her sweater. Yeah. You know, I, I really do. Interesting. So, I mean, it was just, and even I asked, here, here, here's a question I posed to McGlynn that for you ladies to think about. So I, I asked him, I asked a few other people because I don't think the sweater was hers. And he says he thought it was on her during the decapitation. Here or there, I don't know where I'm at on that personally, but he he believes that. So I I believe in him. I believe Sergeant McGlynn, I totally believe. But here's my thing. Why I don't think it was hers is I wore sweaters in 1983, and I can tell you there's not one day my mother would have let me put a sweater, a sweater on without a shirt on mm-hmm. underneath. Not once. Oh, especially, especially in the winter. especially little girls so, too, because, and I think that was a V-neck sweater, right? So she would yeah. have a little, little shirt on underneath. Yep. And whew, you're going down another Avenue. So in my research of V-necks, because that's where I started when I was doing the sweater research, I started with how did V-necks come about and V-necks didn't make their, their way until the 1960s. Mm. And they were actually introduced for males, not for females. So that it, in less than 20 years, some females were wearing them in the late 70s, but it was still kind of a male thing. So with the, with the sweater being possibly a size medium because of the, the way that the stitching was underneath it being a V-neck, and it's a Robert Bruce, which is also the brand that make, made Arnold Palmer sweaters, but 
Arnold Palmer had a rounded neck, and this was a V-neck, but it's the same brand, Robert Bruce. So you're talking about somebody a little more into uh, sweaters a little bit. But, yeah, in, in the fashion a little bit. But then, you know, you come back to, well, well who would have cut the collar out? You know, some people say, uh, I'm going to throw this at you again. Not speculation, just good conversation. <laughs> So we were talking about cutting the collars out. And this is even with the police. So why would they do that? Some people believe it could have been a thrift store. But, you know, I know that that at that time, especially I can remember thrift stores making it making it big. If it was a name brand, they would leave the name brand in there so that they could just charge a little bit more. But then I learned that uh, autistic children do not like the way that cow that uh they feel mm-hmm. on the back of their neck, so they tend to cut out right. their uh, their labels and stuff. So that's true. That was a good possibility. Well, so. also that could speak to not speculation, mind you, just chatting. But um, if that killer was above average intelligence, maybe that sweater was only sold at like there was a famous bar downtown on Kings Highway. Or, you know what I mean, a certain store, and he was scared of that, that that could be, you know, we need to, mm-hmm. let's see your charge receipts. Let's see who was in here, you know, in the last week or whatever, to see who bought this or the last year. Now, was Absolutely. the sweater a male sweater or female? More than likely a, ma- a men's size medium. Which would be really big on a little girl. Because I always ta- thought it was a female. I didn't know it was a men's sweater. I thought it was a honestly just thought it was her sweater i didn't know it was a men's sweater so. somebody might have noticed that their relative you know used to always wear the yellow sweater and then one day it disappeared not putting because you wouldn't think that normally you would never think that until somebody would come back to you on the back end and point it out that this little baby girl was wearing a men's sweater oh wait that's you know right after that month uncle tommy started acting weird those are those little things of no matter how small it is, can be the one that solves the crime. He could have just grabbed any sweater that was around and then Uncle Bob's missing his sweater. Where'd my yellow sweater go? I mean, it could be a number of things, really. Yeah, absolutely. And then also, uh, so with the whole with the whole sweater thing, I don't want you to think that it, it was just, oh, I, I figured out like this. I mean, I really went into it. I, I was researching what... Catholic school was did any of them require a yellow school right. uniform I went into that there was a particular brand of yellow sweater that was being used by the concession stand workers at the St. Louis arena during blues games but it wasn't that sweater either so I mean I, I really really went into it I didn't wow. think I was going to find the sweater but I, I really tried I, I, I just don't want people to think oh I just opened up a web page and found no. it, you know what I and mean? And the fact right. that you could find that exact sweater with the brand, I mean, that is mind-blowing. And again, maybe, you know, somebody, I don't know, you know, how wives buy their husbands clothes sometimes. And I, I don't know, it's the little things that with this film, I hope, I hope somebody somewhere watches this in September and is like, hey, you know, and it jogs their memory about something. Absolutely. And like we were just talking about, like the like the autism. Uh, I'm again. This is this is just conversation. Anything like that. But you know that could in the eighties that could be a reason a person wasn't missed at a school. Not be in school. That's what you said. Yeah, being homeschooled mm-hmm. or you know, the, it, especially in some families at that time, uh, it was shamed. Mm-hmm. I guess you could say that they didn't they didn't want that. It, it was a different it was. time. It really was. And then I'm going to, again, for the, yeah, for those people that want to do research, I, I couldn't really figure out how I got some stuff filmed and you all, and not you, you two, but people out there should really look into uh, Homer G. Phillips and what was occurring in 1972, which is about the time this child would have been born, I, 72, 73. I watched the documentary you know, on that, this. That's a whole avenue yep. to go down. I watched the documentary on this. It's shocking, yeah, so, shocking, so, shocking. So that's a possibility, yeah. Well, and that would... That, that's another possibility. And, of course, that attribution would be... I, I'd always thought that, I, 
well, let me just say this before we ever started this podcast, there was things I would never believe. So for instance, there's a case of this, uh, little girl and it was a family. They had five kids, but the husband hated that one kid and they murdered her and they left her in like a little thing up in the attic. And years later they found it and it, and the mom never said anything. The kids didn't say anything until the police pulled them in. And they're like, well, one day she just disappeared. So I never believed it. So when I was younger, my problem with this case was how, how would a mom not report their child missing? But right there with the hospital things in the seventies, that child could have been adopted and then just, you know, not reported. I, 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 if you don't know what went on there, look it up. It's really. And those those people that don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about illegal adoption, Mm -hmm. the selling of children. Mm -hmm. Like this, this is documented. So I'm, again, this is just conversation. But th- these, again, are the type of conversations we need to have, not the same Vernon Brown conversation mm-hmm. over and over. You know, that's leading nowhere. Well, you know, so. yeah. And w- with that, the like Vernon Brown wasn't even in St. Louis till '85. With the illegal adoptions, many times the moms were young, naive, innocent. They would have a baby. Uh, be knocked out because it was that time that they would do that and wake up and they would say, Oh, your baby passed away. We're sorry. No, that baby was adopted out to somebody else. And and these women didn't find out men and women didn't find out till, I don't know, it was rather recently. So um, that, that would be a thing too. Right, so if somebody right. had a baby yeah. nope. and we're told that it passed away and it was at that. And hospital. one of them was a famous gospel singer. Okay. Yeah. Which that hospital for people that don't know is is the hospital that served the African American community at that time in St. Mm-hmm. Louis? So, and that you know, very again, well. like I said, this film this could have been a nine part episode. I mean, it really could have. It, it's it's yeah, I, that just didn't. There's a lot to digest. I was just going to say, there's so much to it, but yet there's not. So it should have been solved. Like if this happened tomorrow, there's not enough. I would think it'd be solved within 24 hours. And for some reason, oh, the other thing I wanted to ask you too, not to, but anyway, I've said that before. Was there anybody that did not want to talk to you like in the neighborhood or anybody related that were like, kind of gave you the vibe that they just didn't want to be involved or was everybody pretty? Cause I know like the, I'm sure up there in uh, that area, there's some people that still live there and probably don't want to talk about it. I don't know. So there's some people who told me some things that that wouldn't want did, didn't want to be on uh-huh. film uh, that can can probably still be worked on a little bit. There was I won't go into details because it kind of single out who this person was, but there was somebody who is actually quoted in the film who was willing to talk to me, give me pictures and everything. But when it when they found out that it was uh, and they knew it was a documentary and everything, but when they found out it was getting the traction it was because it was on the news and everything, then the, then they kind of wanted money at that point and they pulled away unless they could get paid. So that person should have been in the film and that story would have been awesome. But I don't think, I think their story is still impactful in this film without me having to pay them. So, I mean, I had already had the story from them at that point. It was just them actually telling it. So that was really the only one. Uh, that name? No, 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 because, uh, that that name they would have already known. Uh, this particular part of the story did, didn't involve the murder aspect. It, it it involved the two gentlemen up front, so the the two teenagers. Hmm. So, but yeah, it wasn't it wasn't involved in that part, and they would have known. Uh, forget it. It, it. it it was the relative of the gentleman who passed away. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we we kind of talked about that at Crime Con. You know, there's some stuff happening there that I just can't talk about there. So let me ask you two ladies something. (laughs) 
No, this is a, this is a, this is going to get solved by mm-hmm. Sergeant McGlynn and CC Moore. It really is. But let me ask you two ladies this: when I when I initially walked up to your booth that day and and start talking to you, what what was your thoughts like? Who the hell is this guy? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I you are no, but. I was excited because that, like I said, that case, it's, it's one of those things that's kind of being from St. Louis. It's, it's, and our age, it's a huge story. And like Cam said earlier, it's so huge, yet there's not a lot to it. Like when I did my research, I would pull up, it was mostly on the newspapers like I would go to newspapers.com and I just pulled all that up and there wasn't there was the same three pictures there was you know there wasn't a lot of things on it and so when you said that you were you made this film I was like was I was so happy because it's such a big case in St. Louis and that you dug in you got the right info you're not passing around the folklore that goes around with it it i was i was shocked and i was so happy to see that it was finally getting the attention it deserves because like you said it's been 40 years it is time to give her a name and to find out who did this horrible thing to her and, it's and you know the the members of yeah. that community they they they're happy they're they're thinking the same thing they're like they've heard so many stories people coming yeah. through saying Oh, we're going to do a documentary. Like you can even look at uh, when they were digging uh, the body up in 2009, when they didn't find it, there's news, new uh, actual news footage on YouTube of them. And there's a guy there that says he's doing a documentary. Where is it at? <laughs> like, what did you find? Mm-hmm. But then when you get the news report. It's a lot of work and you got a lot of great access. Those people were yep. really good with you, but that's because they believed you. They knew that you weren't, you know, just the fly by the night kind of person sweeping in there for something to do. Like you're, you're out to help. I think a lot of times they want to, they just want to scale back from what could possibly be just somebody on YouTube trying to get views mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that and, and, and see what it really was because the police really wanted this to happen. I, I can't say that enough. Like they wanted this documentary to happen. I had no roadblocks from them. Mm-hmm. We we didn't go into one interview with them ever saying there's nothing we can't talk about. Like like really like a lot of the stuff like CC Moore and all that, and even about Noreen, uh, all that stuff I didn't even ask about they gave me that information. So they really want it to be out there. Right. And, and it's, it, it's like you all said, it's just time. It's time. And that's how they feel too. Well, it's coming up on the 40th anniversary. If we don't, if we don't do something now, the relatives are going to be passed away. I mean, completely. I mean, to be honest, I was surprised that some of those guys you mm-hmm. talked to were still alive or working. That kind of shocked me. Um, and then also that, uh, I forgot what I was going to say, but that did shock me because detectives are, Oh, that's what I was going to say. Some... L- Lieutenant Atkins is still alive too. <laughs> Lieutenant Atkins is still alive, 90 years See? old, but he, he has uh, some forms of dementia. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to reach out to him yeah. uh, out of respect. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? So, and I would think too, because I didn't know how he would come across at this point in his life. Yeah. And he probably wouldn't want that either. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll tell you this. Well, and you mentioned in the documentary. Oh, I'm I'm I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> we keep button like that, but oh, I was. That's okay. I know. I was going to say um, there was even, and you can tell that it really did affect these police officers because I believe in the documentary there was one that still to this day or before he died was talking about getting the man who. Yeah. So that was killed. That was this little girl. Even this conversation will will correct a lot too. Uh, So that was Herb Riley. Uh, Mm -hmm. Herb Riley, his name is attached to it as well. It should be, but something that's not talked about because you hear about Burgoon and Riley, Burgoon and Riley, and Atkins thrown in there. Well, Herb Riley retired from the police force in 1986, so his involvement as far as being a police officer was only three Mm -hmm. years. Yet. 
the newspaper, which is frustrating to me in researching this because you get to see, like, like you, you telling me, oh, yeah, I've read the newspapers, but me now knowing the newspapers were making errors, <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? So he died in right. 1996, and that's when he made that, that you know, on his deathbed that he, he was going to solve that case. And then the sad thing about that is uh, I was going to reach out to his family, and uh, his son actually has passed away, too. So not only him, but the next generation after him. And I just, I, I kind of stopped there. I didn't want to keep going down the family just to see the information they had, just out of respect for the family. You know, that's your grandfather. I don't know what you really had conversations, but Herb Riley, his wife and his son is, and his son's wife have all passed away. So like I said, Atkins is still alive, but, but he, he's having some health issues. Uh, Burgoon is, 80 something and he's still an active policeman I mean he, he's still and you see him, his interview he's still there he's not he's not missing a beat and, and yeah so there are from talking to him I think still on the force three people that were there on scene and I think there's seven people that were at least a police officer in 83 that are still police officers today. There are police officers today. I don't know if you all caught this in the film, but I think there's a handful, like five police officers who were on the list of kids that, that were missing that are now police officers. Wow. So they actually say that in the film. So I don't know if you caught that. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I thought, mm, I thought I that did. was I cool. Remember seeing it. Yeah. So imagine that. So, I mean, it, I, I don't know for sure. I didn't talk to him, but I mean, that could have been one of the reasons that led him to police, yep. you know? So, yeah, it, 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 but what I was going to say a second ago was I was going to interview uh, Charles Alpin. Uh, we found him. He's in Atlanta now. He, he was the head of the seventh district and we actually show a photo of him in there. Uh, he, he basically told us that the people the police officers that did see the body, uh, they had, it was like one of the first times that they had to set up like a psychiatrist for, for them to talk to. Like it wasn't, that wasn't what they did back then, but they actually had to do that for some of the, the officers. And then there were more officers down there than are reported in the police reports because everybody has a story, but there's only, originally the, there were only two people that went into that room. And that's what the police report states. But there's more officers that have a story and that are documented to have been down there than what's in the police report. So, I mean, that, and something I would like people to know too, now that I'm thinking about it, is if you're familiar with this story, I made it an effort of mine that every person, ever name associated with this story, I show you what they look like. There's a photo of them. Mm -hmm. you, Some of them were hard to get, mm -hmm. like the the photo of uh, Virginia Younger. You know that was hard to get. Sharon Nolte, that was hard to get. Well, so, I think you did a great job. I, I I felt that was important for the film. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. The Younger photograph, the woman Younger. It, that one. The minute I looked at that photo, it was like nothing but sadness towards me. And then I heard you say, yeah, it was the suicide and yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the crazy yeah. thing about her is in her suicide note, uh, she wrote that she wanted to be, uh, she wanted to be cremated because she didn't want people to look down upon yeah. her. So what kind of mind state is that going into suicide? Especially if that was her living, that's what she did. Wow. Which most that people, I think, would look at that as trying to help loved right. ones cope with the loss of their loved ones. Hmm. Well, and I think the way that she was handling the cemetery might have played a little part of that too. Yeah. So anyway, well, Bird, thank you so much for coming. More on than the show. you know. Thank you, ladies. More than we you know. Appreciate it. We're and but. More than you know, do you want to go ahead and plug your show one more time before we leave? Well, I'd like to plug our true 
crime podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Bert. Thank you guys for this opportunity. <laughs> yeah, seriously, because, you You're know, the best. in talking about the film and everything, I, you guys were from St. Louis. It just it just made Click. perfect sense. I told you. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, like this whole thing for, for you has worked it, like this. Yeah, for it to be there. And this whole thing has worked like this. Everything is like. So the film is Our Precious Hope. Yeah. Our Precious Hope Revisited. Our Precious Hope Revisited. The St. Louis Little Jane Doe. Yeah, yeah. So, and and again, people. It's going to be on Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime Video and Mumitu, which you probably never heard of yet. I didn't hear of it. Just started in August. So it, I guess it's, it's, it's like, again, from my understanding from my distributor, kind of like Tubi, but for North America. And, um, it's kind of like what they're, mm-hmm. it's kind of like what Amazon's doing with uh, free freebie or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's kind of that that feel, that vibe. So, those are the two outlets for now. Uh, awesome! I'm going to go download it now. Yeah, there. Yeah, you should. I mean, so there'll be there'll be two ways to see the film, and I'm I'm, I'm throwing that out there. Yeah, I think you guys can figure out why one one might mm-hmm. cost and one might not. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? Yep. <laughs> so, I got you exactly. Uh huh. Uh huh. My, 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 we understand. My whole goal is cool. just to get it seen. I don't care which way. You know, just just learn this information. Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed the interview. It was a lot of fun um, sitting to speak with Ethera or Bird, as he likes to be called. Really interesting guy, and he's really dedicated into getting this case solved. We know there was a lot to take in there, but make sure you tune into the documentary that he alone uncovered things that St. Louis police could not. So it's pretty remarkable. He sold his car to do so, too. I mean, what? That's dedication right there. Anyway, as we sign off. Remember, lock your doors. And keep passing those open windows. Uh, Bye-bye. Love ya. Love ya.